Um, so we'll get started. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Analysis Center, or CISIAC webinar, titled The Building Security and Maturity Model, or BSIM. Uh, my name is Tom McGibbon from the CISIAC. Our present presenters today are Mr. Jason Hill and Mr. Mike Ware from Sigital, who I will introduce in a few minutes. Before we begin, um, a few comments. Um, all the phones have been muted except for the presenters today. Uh, questions can be asked at any time during the presentation by entering them through either the Q&A pane or the chat pane in your WebEx control panel. I will be monitoring questions and questions will be answered at the end of the pre presentation. A copy of the slides will be available afterwards. If you'd like a copy, please send me a request. You can see my email address there on the screen. Um, also, the video and audio are being recorded and we will post it and we will distribute a link to the, to the recording once it is posted. Now to begin today's presentation, let me give a brief commercial overview about the CISIAC. Um, again, please note my email address for any follow-up, but the CISIAC is operated by Quantarian Solutions Incorporated and is funded through the Department of Defense's Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC. So funding for today's free webinar is provided in part by DTIC. The CISIAC is a specialized technical focal point and information clearinghouse for information assurance, cybersecurity, software engineering, modeling and simulation, and knowledge management for DTIC. Please check out our website and join our community of practice at www.thecisiac.com. Also, join us on our LinkedIn discussion groups. We have two groups out there, one called CISIAC Software Intensive Systems and the other one CISIAC Information Assurance. Uh, so now I'll introduce our pre presenters today. Uh, Jason Hills is Managing Principal at Sigital. He has 15 years of experience leading and delivering information security and consulting services. He has expertise in building scalable managed services, conducting adversarial red team engagements, and performing building security and maturity model assessments. Jason has worked with several Fortune 100 clients, primarily in the financial sector. He leads Sigital's New York City practice, where he focuses on building and improving client software security initiatives. Mike Ware is a managing consultant at Sigital. His software security expertise runs the gamut from managing teams responsible for large-scale architecture, static analysis, and dynamic testing practices, to advising clients through multi-year implementations of enterprise-wide software security initiatives. Mike works with Fortune 100 clients, primarily in the financial services and healthcare. He was a contributor to the building security and maturity model. So now I'll turn this presentation over to Jason. Welcome, Jason. Thank you, Tom, and uh, thanks for having uh, me and Mike, um, and thank you to uh, the CSIC as well. Um, uh, today we're going to be talking to you about uh, the building security and maturity model, um, uh, acronym is BSIM. And um, the BSIM, as we'll go through, uh, is, is a data-driven study um, that uh, Sigital has been participating in and running uh, for the last about six years now. But just a little bit about Sigital um, for background. Uh, Sigital is a software security consulting company, um, been around since 1992. Um, uh, the largest software security focused consulting firm in the world. Uh, the slide says 270 employees. We, we've crossed the 300 mark uh, pretty recently. Um, we have offices around the United States as well as in Europe. And uh, our, um, our principals are thought leaders in the industry, published a number of books, white papers, articles. Um, and uh, our, uh, our CTO, Gary McGraw, um, and one of our security principals, Sammy Miguez, um, worked on, on founding uh, the BSIM study. So Sigital um, drew upon its, its experience in the industry to, uh, to help uh, form the BSIM and use its contacts in the industry to come up with the initial firms that participated. So with that, um, uh, let's talk a little bit about what the basics of, of the BSIM are. So a couple of things, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident. There, there are a few things to, to think about here um, <clears throat> that, are, that are foundational um, to uh, why, uh, why we built the BSIM. So um, it's important to understand that software security is more than a set of security functions. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll hear uh, phrases like crypto fairy dust or some sort of silver bullet solution. Um, security, uh, software security is more of a, a, a uh, uh, an approach to uh, building security in as a whole 
um, within within an application or within a system. Individual security functions or individual security solutions do not make up that the the entire um, breadth of what software security <coughs> uh, means for that application. Um, it's also key to understand that the non-functional aspects of design are essential. Um, software is, is built around functional requirements, but there are non-functional requirements around things like you might think about roles and access control, um, things around password security. You know, these are not going to be listed as a, as a functional requirement, but they're non-functional aspects that are, are key to securing an application. And uh, most often the security issues come from uh, misuse and abuse of different non-functional components of a system. So bugs and flaws are 50-50, and this is something that Sigil has seen uh, over the years uh, stay pretty constant. And let me just uh, define those for a moment. A bug is essentially, to keep it simple, a, a mistake in the code. Um, uh, it's an error in the code that leads to a security issue or security vulnerability. Uh, when we talk about flaws, we're talking about the design of the system. There was a design choice made that led uh, to that uh, to that issue. So um, things uh, when you're doing things like code review, penetration testing, um, type different types of assessment and review activities, um, those will uh, those will be identifying bugs. If you're doing things like design reviews or architecture analysis, those are looking for issues um, like flaws. So. Um, what you'll see when we show you uh, the, the framework that the BSIM uses, there are different activities that cover um, uh, both uh, areas that would uh, that would identify both bugs and flaws. Because again, that that each one is about half of of the software security problem. And just like quality, security is an emergent property of the entire system. That's digital. Our, our, our tagline or slogan is, you know, building security in, and that's really something that um, we've been talking about for years, and, and in particular, um, our CTO, Gary McGraw, in, in his book, Software Security, talks about the concept that security has to be uh, a, an emergent uh, part of the system. It has to be built in. It has to be designed in from the ground up. Um, it's not about taking the security functions we were discussing earlier and kind of um, bolting them on. Uh, security needs to be uh, built in holistically. So really, um, how do you do this at scale? How do you do this uh, at large organizations or small organizations um, as part of their business? Well, integrating software security um, uh, controls uh, and concepts into the SDLC is what's necessary. And this is what the BSIM is, is measuring. It is measuring what we call software security initiatives. Um, these are formalized uh, initiatives at, uh, at different firms to, um, to actually uh, ensure that they are building secure software. So there was a, um, a shift in the industry from software security philosophy to how-to around 2006. Um, you started to see different uh, methodologies um, come up uh, on how to do a secure SDLC. Um, some examples of that, um, some things you may have come across are Microsoft's SDO, uh, which is what Microsoft uses um, for their own software development. Uh, Sigital's touch points is a methodology that Sigital has, has published and actually was in um, Gary's software security book, uh, OWASP has class. These are methodologies um, that uh, are used in order to uh, 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 insert security, software security into the SDLC. Now, um, the BSIM has measured uh, over 67 firms now, and uh, every one of these firms has some sort of secure software development lifecycle. Um, in a lot of cases, they're using hybrids of some of these popular methodologies here. Uh, but uh, one thing to point out is that the BSIM is not a methodology. It's a tool for measuring the results of applying this methodology, or whatever methodology you're in use, to a software security initiative to a firm. Um, so uh, I will uh, turn this over to Mike, and he can uh, uh, tell you a little bit more about some of the BSIM fundamentals. Thank you, Jason. All right. So uh, before we dive into the BSIM model itself over the next few uh, slides, I uh, just wanted to reiterate the point and reduce any confusion between what we mean when we say a prescriptive model versus a descriptive model. There's a, a fair amount of confusion, particularly in the press, um, out in the industry, uh, as it relates to the difference between a methodology uh, and a measurement tool. And as Jason said, BSIM is a measurement tool 
It is not a methodology. Every organization should have a methodology, and if you don't have one, uh, that should be your first sort of step after establishing someone to be responsible for software security to develop your own methodology for how software security would, should work within your firm or, or organization. So prescriptive models are very specific. They're very instructive. They point out very specifically how software security should work within a particular organization. Uh, and every organization should have one of those. In fact, every organization in the BSIM model has one of those. The BSIM itself is a model, is a measurement tool that essentially describes um, which particular activities uh, are actually happening within the organization. So within that methodology, it may say that, I don't know, 30 activities should be occurring uh, within various parts of the organization whether it relates to a specific security control like code review or penetration test, or even something a little higher level such as establishing policy uh, or training developers. Uh, the BSIM will indicate and highlight which activities across that entire methodology are actually occurring within the organization. So a distinct difference there to keep in mind as we move forward in this talk. Uh, on the next slide, uh, we start to introduce BSIM itself. So uh, BSIM was started back in uh, 2009, uh, a joint effort between Sigital uh, and Fortify Software, uh, which is now a part of uh, HP. Um, and uh, a few other organizations have also contributed to the model itself. It's a scientific model, so it's, it's grounded in mathematics. And in particular, we've had some uh, statisticians uh, help contribute to the model to help verify and validate it. Uh, now, uh, in BSIM 5, which was released in October of 2013, uh, there's 67 organizations who have participated and who are in, in the study now. Uh, and it covers 161 individual measurements. Um, now, you may look at, well, 67 firms, 161 measurements, how does that work? Uh, some firms have been measured multiple times by now, uh, and in those cases we've seen um, you know, maturity improvement. Uh, some areas they improve in, others they may uh, deflect a bit, but it shows evolution of how the software security program is changing within organizations when you have multiple measurements. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later as we show how BSIM can be used to, to measure programs. Um, in addition to that, some particularly large organizations, think about a bank for instance, um, you have multiple lines of businesses or individual business units. Um, some organizations measure each of those lines of businesses um, by themselves. And so uh, if you're a large organization that's broken up into eight major business units, you may want to do eight individual measurements for each line of business to get a better feel for how each of those lines of businesses are performing. Uh, or, or what their programs uh, sort of look like from a benchmark perspective. On the next slide, uh, we kind of give you a little flavor for uh, the types of firms that are in the study. Uh, you know, not every firm uh, chooses to be uh, mentioned publicly, and that's okay, but this gives you a little flavor for the different industries that are representative. You see a little bit of uh, financials, uh, ISVs, uh, high-tech firms, uh, you also see healthcare uh, firms as well. So uh, very broad representation across really any industry uh, that, that's in the space. And we're always looking to grow this community, of course. And we have since uh, BSIM 5, actually. Uh, so on the next slide, so uh, let me talk a little bit about how we went about building BSIM itself back in 2009. So uh, as we mentioned earlier in the talk, there was a lot of uh, you know, there were a number of folks coming out with prescriptive models, you know, things that you should do from a software security perspective. So effectively, we wanted to ask the question, okay, prescription is good and it's necessary, right? Uh, but what are firms actually doing? What do programs look like? Uh, and are there differences in how a bank does this versus an ISV or other types of organizations? Um, so we set out, you know, with that sort of uh, agenda in mind, uh, and we, you know, through some context that we had, uh, interviewed nine well-known um, firms that we know had, that had software security initiatives. Uh, BSIM itself, uh, the assessment methodology behind it, uh, is, is very much interview-driven. So we went on site, we met with each firm, 
We conducted a couple of days of interviews with various uh, stakeholders across the organization, uh, folks from architecture, folks from testing, folks from governance and, and policy, uh, risk management. Uh, and we collected all of the facts that, that we were able to discover uh, in those interviews. Uh, we discovered in that process with these nine firms 110 distinct activities uh, through those interviews that those firms were, were doing from a software security perspective. I'll show you an example of, of what an activity is a little bit later. Um, we then, Sigital and, and Fortify, jointly uh, then looked at those 110 activities and tried to organize them and classify them in a way that, that was meaningful. Uh, and so we built a framework, what we call the BSIM framework, uh, as the next step uh, from these interviews. Uh, and then from there, we had the framework, which had a collection of activities. Uh, we then produced a scorecard in a way to sort of indicate, uh, you know, which activities were observed for each firm. Uh, and the scorecard allows organizations to basically compare themselves to what others are doing. Uh, and you can use that as a planning tool uh, to, to ask the question, okay, these organizations have invested in certain activities. Does it make sense for us to do that? Uh, and that's a question that you should ask yourself. In some cases, it might make sense, and others it may not, uh, depending on your culture, your setup, and your, your overall initiative uh, objectives. Uh, so we're at 67 firms now, and you know one of the sort of the key and interesting things that we've learned is that there's really no special snowflake. Uh, you know when we set out and started this back in 2009, we weren't sure what we were really going to find out. Uh, but it turns out that the BSIM model, you know, we've never met an organization that we haven't used our model, haven't been able to use our model to, to give them an accurate measurement to describe what their program looks like. Uh, and so there really is no special snowflake. Everyone has their own software security program. They tweak it, they tune it, it works a little bit differently. But there are certainly some common themes that we've observed over the years. Um, on the next slide, um, you know, this is really to highlight that, you know, we pay careful attention to making sure that our model is actually uh, accurate uh, and, uh, and precise. And we've, uh, you know, we contract with st st statisticians and they run statistical analysis uh, on the data sets that we have. We do this for every BSIM release that we have. Uh, and uh, you know, we reached a point with uh, 30 firms where uh, you know, we actually had a significant uh, amount of data meaningful set of data where we could run some statistical analysis and start to, you know, put us in a position where we could ask some more interesting questions. And this is something that we're actively doing now. So we can start to ask questions like, um, you know, is there a correlation between activities for certain types of organizations that look a certain way? Uh, that's a very complex thing to ask and find answers to without having uh, an underlying data set that, that is very meaningful. And BSEM is has provided the groundwork for us to be able to, to ask those, answer those, those types of questions. Um, so on the next slide, um, one of the, um, you know, in addition to the understanding of the difference between descriptive and prescriptive models, one of the other important things to recognize is that as a descriptive model, BSIM will unearth facts uh, and we make observations when we do a BSIM assessment. Um, so it might tell us, for instance, that monkeys eat bananas. Bananas, you know, that's a fact. That's a, that's something that we know is true. Uh, but the BSIM itself is not about, um, you know, things like how many bananas should be eaten, eaten, uh, how often those bananas should be eaten, uh, uh, whether the bananas should be yellow versus green when you eat them, other things like that. Um, or, you know, what types of bananas are, are better to eat than others. Thing, anything that um, is more instructive or prescriptive on top of the fact that monkeys eat bananas. So BSIM is going to tell us that simple fact. Uh, it's not about uh, anything above and beyond that. Um, to, put a, to put a software security light on that, think about static analysis or how your organization may be, may be deploying and making use of code review technologies. Uh, there's many different ways to deploy a stack analysis tool or really establish a code review capability um, in terms of what tools you use, how you run those tools or deploy them, who's responsible for looking at the results, verifying problems, remediating those problems, various models for doing that. 
Uh, BSIM would tell us whether there's a static analysis or a code review capability in place established, uh, but it won't tell us those other aspects of the capability itself. On the next slide, uh, we see our software security framework. Uh, this, by the way, is available on bsim.com, uh, the framework itself, and on every single activity that's in the framework. Uh, you can go out to bsim.com. We encourage you to do that. Uh, it's uh, freely available to you uh, to read up on and, and use as part of your, your, your daily work here. Uh, the framework itself has uh, four main domains, and those are is that top row that you see. The, the domains consist of governance, intelligence, SSDL touchpoints, and deployment practices. Under each domain, there were three practices. Uh, if we look at governance, for instance, strategy and metrics is a practice, compliance and policy is a practice, and training is a practice. So there's 12 practices total in the framework. Under each practice, there's a set of activities. Uh, and those activities, those individual activities, organized uh, in three levels, uh, level one, level two, level three. Uh, they're organized into those levels based on how frequently we observe that activity uh, at organizations who have participated in the study. So the more common activities are placed in the level one bucket under each practice. Less common, less frequently observed activities uh, we place in the level three. That's how sort of the maturity uh, ranking process works in the model itself. Uh, so uh, this is the framework, four domains, 12 practices. On the next slide, we show an example of uh, an activity. This one in particular is from the architecture analysis practice uh, which you'll notice is uh, a component of the SSDL touchpoints domain. And this activity is for AA1.2. Uh, if you go out to bsim.com, you can click on the architecture analysis practice and actually see this in addition to the other activities that fall within this practice. Uh, so uh, every activity has a description like this uh, that describes the intent behind the activity itself. In this case, uh, this particular activity is about performing design review for high-risk applications or high-risk software components uh, within your within your within your uh, organization. <clears throat> On the next slide, um, so in the current model, we're at 112 activities. Um, now, when we conduct our assessments and, and during the interview process, occasionally we find that there's some new activities that are occurring that we weren't previously, that we didn't know about. You know, this is a natural evolution of the model. Uh, and once we see uh, a handful of firms actually describing that they undertake this new activity, we include it in the model. Uh, in this case, uh, for BSIM 6, the next release, we're, we're including a, a new activity around operation of a bug bounty program. Uh, and that's going to fall under the configuration management, vulnerability management practice uh, within BSIM itself. Uh, so uh, we do uh, naturally evolve uh, the model itself uh, based on what we observe uh, in terms of new activities uh, as we conduct our interviews and, and carry out our assessments. Uh, you can move on, Jason. Thanks. Um, on the next slide here, what we wanted to show is, a, is kind of give you a, a snapshot of a, some, some basic information for the 67 firms uh, that have participated in the study thus far uh, in terms of uh, the age of initiatives, which you can see uh, the oldest uh, software security program that, that at least we're aware of uh, is just over 18 years, which is a long time. The newest uh, in the study is uh, about four months. Uh, so a long, you know, diverse range of sort of environments and organizations are represented in the model and the data set. Um, SSG, you're probably asking, what is SSG? SSG stands for Software Security Group. Um, the Software Security Group within organizations are the, the, the staff or the people who are responsible um, every day and dedicated to the software security program, the software security initiative. Uh, and so that's uh, how we view the SSG, and that's probably the number one 
um, thing that we've observed in, in the BSIM model itself is that every organization who has been successful about software security has a dedicated SSG, has someone in charge with some staff committed to making this, uh, this sort of thing successful. The satellite is a little bit different. The satellite consists of other individuals within your organization that um, are responsible for software security or at least drive an adoption of various things, or components of the program, uh, but don't directly uh, report into the SSG organizational hierarchy. So these are individuals that exist and are sort of implanted across your environment to help drive adoption of the overall program. Um, if you think about this with, um, you know, something like code review or static analysis, some organizations will um, implement a, a champion-based program where they certify champions within development teams to take uh, uh, responsibility for uh, scanning applications and triaging uh, results from scans. Uh, that is an example of embedding security champions across the dev teams to help drive adoption of various components of the program. Uh, so that's what we mean by the satellite there. Uh, and then in terms of developer size, this is just simply the number of developers that um, uh, these organizations that, that are in the study have expressed that they have within their, 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 uh, within their, their uh, you know, firm or organization. And so, uh, one of the, you know two of the, the key themes that that we've observed from this from the data is that um, everyone has someone responsible for software security, the head of the software security group, uh, and that growing a satellite across the organization uh, is incredibly helpful uh, and meaningful in terms of making progress in terms of implementing the program itself. On the next slide, we show a, an example of the scorecard. Uh, and the numbers that you see here might be a little bit tricky to see that in the slide. That's also available on the website, uh, actually in the document that you can download, uh, get a better view of that. But essentially, this is the scorecard that when we conduct assessments, uh, we'll leave behind within the organization. Uh, and uh, essentially, it shows each domain Every activity, uh, this scorecard represents the number of firms in the study that actually undertake that activity. Um, and the items highlighted in yellow uh, are the most common activities uh, in each practice um, uh, that we've observed. And so that might be a good starting point, for instance, if you do an assessment uh, and there's a couple of common activities that a number of organizations are have invested in or undertaking, but you're not, that might be a, a good sort of activity to uh, consider whether you should start doing that as a way to, to quickly um, improve your program. On the next slide, uh, we show an example of a, of a spider diagram uh, for all 67 firms uh, in the study. The spider diagram is something that we use as a, as a very simple measurement technique. Uh, what this shows you is a high watermark score of averages for all the firms in the study. Uh, and so the spokes on this diagram represent each practice in the study. Uh, and then you can see the average watermark scores for each firm uh, that has participated. Uh, Jason will describe in the slides that follow when he talks more specifically about using BSIM to measure programs uh, as a way or how you can use this, this particular diagram to sort of uh, understand how your program relates to, to others uh, and what you can pot potentially do to uh, improve uh, your maturity or make certain investments as a planning uh, tool. Jason? All right. Thanks, Mike. And, uh, you know, using the BSIM as, as a measurement tool is really where, uh, you know, that's really where the, the power and the, the, um, the benefits of the BSIM um, come from. So um, Mike went through some of the BSIM terms and some of the data uh, and what some of the visuals look like, but how do you use the BSIM in order to measure um, your own initiative? So um, Mike was showing the uh, spider diagram uh, view before. So this is uh, often the most common view that, that people think of when they think about the BSIM. Um, what the spider diagram shows you is a low resolution view of, of either a specific firm's data or a set of data. So it gives you a, an opportunity to uh, do what we call a high watermark comparison. 
So what this is showing uh, for the BSIM Earth, which the BSIM 567 firms with their um, uh, with their uh, high watermark scores averaged, um, that, that that makes up the uh, the orange line on this. The blue line is some fake firm data, and what the high watermark shows is what is the highest level maturity activity that was achieved in that different practice area. So if a in software environment. Um, there is at least one level two activity, um, there would be a high watermark score of two. So this is a low resolution view. It doesn't necessarily show um, uh, any true maturity below that level. And we have other views that, that show that data. But it is a good way to get that quick view of a firm's maturity as it compares to um, uh, other uh, firm averages, the BSIM Earth different verticals, um, uh, the ability to compare lines of business or business units or different um, SDLCs within an organization. It also lets you chart progress um, very easily uh, over time. So what you're seeing here uh, is that this firm um, is a, a, has a higher a high watermark score for code review um, and pen testing considerably higher than the BSIM Earth average. Um, and they are below the BSIM Earth average, for example, in strategy and metrics and security features and design because they reached a high water mark of one there. Um, it doesn't show it here, but if there were no activities observed in, uh, in a practice area, that would go down to zero there. Um, so what, what generally, uh, uh, generally firms that have a rounded um, curve, they have more balanced security programs than firms that have kind of a, a bumpy or a, a prickly shape to it, um, or even sometimes a butterfly shape. Something like that would emerge if you have some uh, level zero uh, high water marks. Um, but it's important to, to remember that um, this is not a, uh, a value judgment. This is not a judgment of good versus bad. It is just a comparison of uh, data so that you can see what you're doing as compared to other BSIM firms. So here's a, a, a BSIM scorecard that has fake firm data in it. Um, and this is what some of the analysis looks like at the end of a, a, of a BSIM assessment. So Mike was talking about the top 12 activities. These are the things that essentially everybody is doing, that the vast majority of BSIM participants are doing. Um, there's one activity in each practice area. So what you would see on the scorecard um, at a glance is that you have some um, purple highlighted um, uh, activities with a one in it, that that's an activity that this fake firm is doing that everybody else is doing. And then you have the red ones um, that are showing, well, here's an activity that everyone is doing that you're not doing. Um, it doesn't say good or bad on that, but you know, one would look at this and say, well, if, if this activity is being done by all the other participants, um, you know, it, it's showing some level of benefit, that's probably a good place for us to start when we want to put together a roadmap in maturing our initiative. Um, what you see on the scorecard also with the blue highlighted areas is a blue shift, and this shows where the high water mark is uh, below the average of the rest of the BSIM Earth. So right here, this scorecard um, it actually also shows all the, the counts of the observations. So for example, PT 1.1 on the top right, that says 62, that means out of the uh, 67 BSIM 5 firms that are part of the data pool, uh, PT1.1 was observed at 62 of those firms. So there's a lot of data captured right here, and this is the highest resolution view that, um, that the BSIM uh, offers in terms of uh, data representation. There are a few other visuals uh, that, that come with a BSIM analysis. Uh, we call the equalizer diagrams. It shows um, both a vertical and horizontal view of the different practice areas so that you can look um, for each practice area, are we really showing true maturity? And for each maturity level, level one, two, and three across the areas, um, how, how complete uh, is that view? Um, so it's really, um, it's really about taking the data and putting it in uh, a few different uh, visuals so that you can uh, do some quick analysis of it. Um, in, in firms that are doing multiple BSIM measurements, they're taking their data across different lines of business and, and doing, uh, doing a lot of uh, comparisons and analysis and looking at what some of the things that their software security group provides centrally across the board and how effective that is for different lines of business. Um, so there's a there's a lot of data uh, that comes out of a BSIM assessment as it's compared to the pool that, that, that one can work with. And it's really um, interesting looking at trends over, over multiple measurements. 
So doing uh, the uh, having the Beeson data pool um, uh, allows for uh, comparisons across different firms. So um, you know, uh, Mike was saying earlier, there's no special snowflake. Or uh, actually, what uh, what Sammy Miguez, one of the Beeson creators, likes to say is that uh, every snowflake is special. It's kind of a, a nicer way to say it. But um, uh, you know, Mike was also mentioning earlier that when um, Gary and Sammy uh, first went in to do the BSIM, they thought they were going to have to create a different model for each vertical. Uh, they thought they would have one for finance, and they would have one for ISVs, and they would have one, uh, you know, for healthcare and insurance. It was going to be all different. But what they found was that um, the same model um, has fit all the programs that have been measured, and there are not um, huge differences in what uh, what different verticals are doing in order to secure their software. So what you see here is a comparison of the average high watermark score for uh, ISVs, um, firms that are developing software, um, which makes up 25 of the 67 participants, compared to the financial vertical, which is 26 of 67 participants. These are the two um, best represented verticals in the BSIM data pool for BSIM 5. And you can see that there are not uh, drastic differences. You know, you, you might... Um, you might make some assumptions and look at the data and say, well, something like security testing, for an example, um, is probably not going to be always be at a very high level of maturity, say, in, in financial firms, because you know, putting putting very advanced um, security testing in their QA process um, might, might be challenging for, say, a financial firm, whereas some other you know high tech or ISVs might be doing more of that. But generally, you can see that. Um, People are uh, different firms are are doing uh, doing the same things. We also do comparisons across uh, different uh, geogra geographies. Um, we've looked at the data of U.S. versus Europe versus Asia, um, and there there are some interesting trends uh, that that come up there. Um, what we find is that that there is about um, uh, a bit of uh, maybe a two to three year lag in the different uh, maturity that we're seeing um, of Europe versus the U.S. Uh, and then even within different geographic regions in the United States, uh, we can do data comparisons to see what the maturity of those different regions are. So uh, one of the things I had mentioned earlier, one of the useful um, ways to look at the data is measurements uh, over time to see what the changes are. So um, there are 21 firms in the BSIM 5 data pool that were measured twice, um, with an average of two years between the, the measurements. And it showed that these firms uh, had an average of 16% increase in the number of activities uh, that were observed. So the firms are using the BSIM as a roadmap uh, to determine what direction they want their uh, program to go in. Um, they're using the BSIM uh, to uh, drive strategy, to drive budgets, um, and uh, uh, to get a common understanding across the different uh, software security program stakeholders on what the goals are. Um, and uh, firms that uh, are, are within certain verticals can look at what their what their peers and their competitors are doing. Um, of course, all this data is is anonymized. Um, we don't release a uh, uh, a vertical until there are enough participants in it, so as to sufficiently anonymize the data. Um, so um, just to point that out. The data pool um, is anonymous. Uh, there are firms that choose to um, allow us to uh, note that they are participants, and you saw that logos page before. But there are also a number of firms that choose not to. But no individual firm's data um, is is really uh, is reported as part of the BSIM data pool. So let's look at the BSIM just by the numbers. Um, you know, uh, this is BSIM one through BSIM five. Um, it's it's about twelve to um, fourteen months. Probably it's been between different releases. Uh, you can see in the first BSIM there were the initial nine firms that were measured, and then BSIM uh, the number of fir participating firms has grown quite a bit. Our target for BSIM six is a hundred firms. Um, we're currently over the eighty mark in terms of uh, firms that have been measured. And once the number of firms um, hits a hundred, that's when the analysis will be done and the BSIM six will be released. Um, it'll it'll contain the new measurement data and potentially new activities that have been observed uh, throughout the different measurements that are being done. Um, the way your measurement is done is uh, through um, uh, an, an interview-driven process. Uh, um, 
where. Uh, so the BSIM is uh, uh, Creative Commons. It's freely available. Uh, anyone can download it and, and look at the, uh, the results of the data pool and the different activities. But in terms of official measurements that go into the data pool, that's done by, uh, by Citadel, uh, by a small number of Citadel and HP uh, personnel. We follow a, a methodology for doing the measurements and conducting the interviews. So that's how the data is being gathered. Um, so uh, you can also see a few things here that um, as the BSIM uh, new versions have come out, you've had second and third measurements taking place. So this is where firms are tracking their progress. Um, SSG members, um, 976 uh, different so uh, software security group members, meaning these are people whose full-time job is to focus on software security. Satellite, which uh, Mike described earlier, um, almost 2,000 different satellite members uh, combined with all the BSIM tar uh, participants. Um, oh, over a quarter of a million developers uh, are represented across the different BSIM firms. And there was a, a recent IDC study that came out for 2014. They estimate that there are 11 million professional software developers in the world. So the BSIM touches 2.5% of that number. Um, so we have uh, certainly a, a way to go before um, uh, that's a significant percentage of the global development population, but um, making progress there. So um, in terms of the age of the software security groups, you can look um, in the BSIM document. It talks about the oldest and the youngest. I think the oldest is 15 years old. Um, the youngest would be you know, zero or one firms that are just getting started with their measurement. Um, but an, another interesting number that comes out is that there's an average of about 1.4 SSG members uh, per 100 developers. And that becomes um, something that uh, different firms are using to, to when, the, when they're thinking about, is our software security group um, large enough? Do we have uh, enough people to support our efforts? Um, they're using that as, as kind of a guideline to see um, well, how, how large they want to grow their group. And we're seeing different verticals um, better represented. Um, for BSIM 6, we're really uh, making a push. We'd like to see more um, healthcare firms uh, participate. Um, that's a vertical we'd like to, to see grow enough so that we can release uh, that, that specific vertical data. Um, but uh, we are looking for uh, you know, including as many participants as we can, because really what, what the BSIM is doing is helping uh, move forward the state of the, state of the industry because the BSIM uh, helps uh, by uh, developing a community. The BSIM um, is actually, so Sigital, Sigital is the owner of the data pool, but the BSIM has a board that uh, has a BSIM uh, members on it that are not from Sigital, so it's a community-led uh, community initiative. Um, and uh, twice a year, there are BSIM conferences, uh, one in the US and one in Europe. Um, and uh, uh, at the RSA conference, there are BSIM mixers. And this is something where BSIM members, participating firms, uh, get together um, and talk about uh, different software security initiative related topics. And um, the, the BSIM conferences have been very successful in terms of uh, information sharing. And uh, there is also a moderated uh, BSIM mailing list where BSIM participating firms can have discussions on, on different topics. Um, the next uh, BSIM community conference for 2014 is going to be in November in California. And uh, that's where all, all participating firms are, are able to attend. And, uh, and the majority of them do. Um, and it's, uh, it's been a very good uh, collection of uh, a lot of the uh, uh, software security focused professionals um, in the industry. So going from uh, BSIM 5 to BSIM 6, so BSIM 5 was released in October 2013. Um, and it's also been localized for a number of different languages. And again, the BSIM is a yardstick. Um, this is, you can see where you stand, um, look at what your peers are doing. And as I mentioned before, our goal for BSIM 6 is 100, uh, 100 participating firms. Um, we're also starting to age some of the data. We want to make sure that, that there is data freshness in the BSIM pool. So um, there was a data freshness threshold of 48 months for BSIM 5, meaning um, all of the data in the BSIM 5 uh, had to be, um, the measurement had to be done at least of at most 48 months ago. The majority of the data in there is not, is not that aged. Um, but we're decreasing that window to 36 months for BSIM 6. So um, we're, we're looking for firms to get remeasured so that we make sure we have accurate data, or in some cases, uh, some firms may not be part of the data pool for BSIM 6, but that, that will all be published. So where can you learn more? 
Um, so bsim.com, specific to bsim, is, uh, it would be your first stop. Um, there you can download the bsim document and uh, you can look at a, a number of links to different press articles. Um, Sigital also does a uh, Justice League um, blog where our uh, principals do posts and um, very often we're talking about uh, different uh, bsim related topics. Um, everything falls within what the software security framework is. And uh, there's also Gary McGraw, one of the creators of the BSIM, does a uh, podcast called The Silver Bullet. And uh, in this, he also talks to a number of different BSIM participating firms, and they often talk about um, their software security initiatives. And then um, uh, 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 Gary's book, um, Software Security, um, he talks about um, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the uh, foundational knowledge for the different activities that the BSIM describes. Um, so Gary's email, uh, our, our, um, our CTO is on here, but um, if anybody had any questions, wanted to reach out, I'm definitely happy to chat about the BSIM. So I'm Jason Hills and my email is jhills at citadel.com. Um, please feel free to reach out uh, if you had any questions, you wanted to learn more about the BSIM, if you're interested in participating and wanted to find out the details on that. Um, but that's, uh, that's uh, what we had for the presentation. Um, okay. I appreciate everyone's time, and I think there may well, be some, some follow-up questions. Yeah, there are some questions. Well, um, thank you very much, Jason and Mike. Um, we are going to move into the question and answer uh, point, but at this point we wanted to get a little, before we lose people, we wanted to get a little bit of feedback on, uh, on the presentation. So there's been a, a poll that has been posted, and uh, uh, we asked for, uh, for feedback from you. Um, but at this point, we will, you know, we do have a few questions. Um, let me see. Uh, okay, I just got to open these up. All right. So, um, one of the questions I had is that for organizations that are, you know, doing this building security in activities, do they typically have other quality improvement programs going on at the same time? Um, you know. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I would say that that the you know doing a BSIM, um, it, it's kind of uh, it would be mutually exclusive of any any other initiatives. We um, we see uh, firms, as we mentioned earlier, they're using a number of different methodologies because um, that's really what's making up their software security initiative. Um, you know, uh, uh, and and often when firms are determining that they want to do a BSIM, they've had some other uh, methodologies that they're uh, that they're following. Um, uh, I guess I, I, I personally don't have uh, too many specific examples to mention sure. of, of some of those, and, and you know, Mike may, may be able to jump in. But I guess you know, the short answer is yes, the BSIM is compatible with, with a lot of these other, other initiatives. Right. Okay. Very good. Very good. All right. Um, so has any, any uh, BSIM evaluation been done on, on any large open, system, open source software uh, projects? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a great question. Um, you know, the... The challenge with that is that um, some of the, you know, the large open source uh, projects, they will have uh, some sort of, um, you know, organized um, uh, uh, entity or, or maybe a nonprofit corporation. Um, we haven't had them, uh, them come in and, and bring in um, uh, Citadel or HP to do any, any BSIM evaluations there. Of course, the BSIM does um, have some activities that are related to open source software, and we have evaluated firms that are active users of some of those large projects and contributors back to them. But we haven't done a BSIM measurement specifically of uh, uh, an, uh, free and open source software organization or foundation. That, that hasn't happened yet. It would be certainly interesting if we could. Mm -hmm. Understand. Okay. Um, there was a couple questions early on. It says it's interesting that the stats are being studied. Uh, you know, given the brevity of this presentation, the stats aren't well described here, but they seem to verify that there is some correlation from data across the organiz 30 organizations. Uh, what about a higher level correlation? Is there some statement about security which says the higher the rating, the more likely the organization is to do X or something? Is there anything like that? Yeah, so I mean, that's that's that kind of gets into the area where the, the BSIM, um, it, it stays descriptive um, and it doesn't go into it in a bag. But as security professionals and, and as security practitioners, we, we certainly do use the BSIM as a guideline and, and take a look at, at trends in, in the data pool. Um, a lot of the uh, firms that are getting higher 
um, uh, vSIM scores. Generally, their initiatives um, have, have been around uh, for longer, which is, which is not surprising. You, know, you could see that there. Um, and they have um, uh, more drivers towards software security. So it, it's not surprising that finan the financial vertical um, has the highest as a vertical, uh, has high maturity um, on average because they're so highly regulated. Um, right. You know, I, I come prior to Sigital from a, uh, a you know a federal background. I was at Sandy Labs of the Department of Energy, and from you know my experience with uh, with the different federal agencies, it would be very interesting to see what federal BSIM data would would look like. Um, that that's a vertical I'd be interested in seeing. I don't know um, how likely it is that that uh, different uh, federal organizations are, are going to want to share their data. Um, but uh, you, you can kind of see when you break things down by the vertical, um, different different trends and different activities that make sense. I was mentioning earlier that you don't see a lot of financial organizations doing security testing, and BSIM defines security testing as doing standardized uh, testing in, in QA for security issues. You don't see them doing it at a high level of maturity. It would be more like high-tech firms, software development firms that are doing that type of thing. And you also don't see it, uh, um, the high level of maturity in security testing for very large organizations because it becomes difficult to scale those types of activities. So there are, there are some things that we see there when we, when we uh, look for correlations. I see. Okay. So is the checklist that was put together uh, prescriptive or descriptive in nature? So, yeah, I guess the checklist uh, that's being referred to is um, that's on the DHS site. Um, yeah. So that checklist includes BSIM as well as a number of other maturity models. Um, I, I think it was something that checklist, uh, I, I haven't studied it, but I've read through it. It, it, it looks to be more prescriptive using yeah, different different. Do. Yeah, different frameworks, different methodologies to drive it. BSIM is one of them. Um, and it's an example of one of the things that you can do. You can take the descriptive BSIM data and start to derive some uh, you know, prescriptive goals out of it. And I think that's a good example of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, good. Is it reasonable to require software suppliers to at least undergo a BSIM evaluation, meet certain minimum high watermarks? Yeah, so that's a great question, and it's something we didn't go into in this presentation. There's um, there's a version of the BSIM called the VBSIM, it's the vendor BSIM, and uh, that's something that's been around, I think, since BSIM 2, maybe it was BSIM 3 that it came out, um, and it's something that uh, in the financial vertical and insurance, they're, they're starting to use as part of their third-party vendor assessment programs. What the VBSIM does is it takes um, 15 of the activities that really focus on third-party software development um, and uh, turns that into um, either a self-assessment or an assessment done by the firm. Um, firms typically prefer the latter, doing that assessment because they already have some sort of third-party risk process. They add the VB SIM in where they, in an interview-driven fashion, um, they look for evidence of those 15 activities taking place and then you can use the VB SIM um, as, as, a, uh, as a measurement of the maturity of, of the process uh, for software development for your third parties and vendors. Um, the information on the VBSIM is also on the BSIM site, um, and we uh, in Sigil, we're seeing a lot of, uh, of our clients and other firms that we talk with starting to use the VBSIM as part of their assessment. So I think it's, it's certainly reasonable to, um, and, and uh, it's proving to be very useful to use the VBSIM to measure your vendors. Um, you may have some small firms, they not, may, may not be looking to do some sort of full BSIM measurement, uh, but a VBSIM is reasonable. If they have done a full, full BSIM, they can extrapolate the activities from that into a VBSIM result and, and hand that off I to see. you as the, you know, the assessor. Well, I understand. Okay, good. Um, given the makeup of, of our audience here today, are, do you see any participation from defense-related firms? Um, not a whole lot. You know, I think I think the uh, you know it's it's a challenge in that um, uh, those programs um, have certain uh, sensitivity levels that they're not necessarily in control of, so they're they're hesitant to go and uh, make their data part of a pool. You know, we we've talked about the idea of doing some sort of uh, federally focused uh, BSIM where the data would be separate, but that that really uh, may not be as as interesting because it's it, it's about the the volume of the data that makes it statistically significant 
Um, so um, we would certainly welcome uh, more participants, defense contractors, uh, but it's not something that we've seen a whole lot of, um, of uh, firms doing. Mm -hmm. I understand. Uh, the um, final question that I have from a participant is, can I use the BSIM methods and information to help my clients in my consulting business, or are there any restrictions? So the BSIM, yeah. yeah, I mean, the BSIM data pool is private, but the resulting study, um, BSIMs 1 through 5 and upcoming BSIM 6 or Creative Commons, you can use it. We encourage it. Um, we are aware of a lot of other uh, firms and other consulting firms that are using it as part of their uh, assessments and methodology. Um, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's certainly um, uh, something that other firms are doing, and so that's available to anybody who's, uh, who's listening in. Um, if they wanted to use the BSIM for their initiative, if they wanted to use it as part of their consulting practice, um, that is uh, perfectly allowable. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. Well, I think that's all the questions, and I, so I think that pretty much ends, ends our presentation today. Um, once again, I'd like to thank you, Jason and Mike, for uh, uh, this excellent presentation. I've heard about BSIM for a lot of years, and so um, I think this has helped a lot, a lot of us. So, so thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having us. Okay. Thanks, Tom. All right. Okay, take care. And we'll we'll see you all next time.